Welcome to the Cables to Clouds podcast. Cloud adoption is on the rise and many network infrastructure professionals are being asked to adopt a hybrid approach. As individuals who have already started this journey, we would like to empower those professionals with the tools and the knowledge to bridge the gap. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cables to Clouds podcast. Uh, My name is Alex Perkins. I will be your host for this episode. Uh, I am at Bumps in the Wire on socials. I'm joined, uh, as as usual, you know, with my two co-hosts, uh, Tim McConaughey at Juan Golbez and Chris Miles at BGP Maine. Um, this is this episode is actually going to be a, a addition to uh, a podcast episode that we did um, as part of our Cloud Demystified demo series. Um, we have a guest, Nico Vibert who came on to talk to us about Kubernetes networking and kind of um, like an intro to Cilium, if you will, right? Um, just, you know, there was a lot of, Cisco just bought a company called Isovalent, right? And they have a product called Cilium. So we thought this was a perfect time to come on and start talking about what that means for network engineers. Um, and Nico is, is right in the middle of all this, uh, just wrote a book, uh, about all this. So Nico, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself for anybody that has not listened to the podcast episode Yeah, and uh, needs to hear a bit more about you. And uh, yeah, when I when we did the podcast, uh, I work for Isovalent and I no longer for <laughs> work for Isovalent, I work for Cisco. So I'm a senior staff technical marketing engineer at Isovalent uh, at Cisco. Uh, we're, we're kind of, Isovalent has just been acquired, uh, but we are still within the Cisco security group, uh, almost as an independent unit. Uh, literally, my officially I'll be on the payroll of Cisco UK uh, in two days' time. So, uh, yeah, exciting times, changes, but uh, I'm back at Cisco after nine years away, so it's exciting for me. Congratulations. Nice. Yeah, congratulations yeah, for sure. Yeah, exciting. Cool. All right. Um, so yeah. So like I said, so this is actually a continuation of a audio based podcast that we did, right? This, this will be an exclusive demo that's just for YouTube. Um, there'll be cards linking it to the actual podcast episode. If you somehow found this and did not come from that episode, uh, definitely worth a, a listen. We went through a lot of the basics. I think there was still, even after an hour of talking, we still had a lot of stuff that. We didn't get to that. Maybe maybe there'll be a part two down the road. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff to talk about in this space. Um, but but again, today is really just uh, Nico wanted to walk us through a demo. I think he's got a couple slides for us, and then we're going to go through a demo of some of the use cases of Cilium, and we're just going to ask some questions along the way. So, uh, Nico, you want to go ahead and kick us off? Yeah. So uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen, and I'll I'll start with. Um some slides I uh, co-presented. Hopefully you can see my screen okay. Yep. Yeah, that looks great. Awesome. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole the whole thing, but I co-presented a session at uh, KubeCon Paris uh, a month or so ago. Um, and it was pretty insane how many people turned up. I've I've never been part of anything like this before. And it's not because people came to see me or anything. It was just because we were presenting an introduction to Cilium. Um, and we had about 1,600 people sign up for the session. And the room That's could insane. only feel, <laughs> the room was like, could only feel like 300. And That's even like insane. 20, <laughs> I know. Even like 25 minutes before the session started, the, the room was packed um, and we could have been in the keynote room and it would have been pretty, pretty full. So uh, it was it was a really a privilege to be able to talk to so many people. Um, but it, again, it wasn't because of my <laughs> people came to see me, but just because of, we had a very exciting project to, uh, to talk about. So we tried to just 
reintroduce Cilium to some people and, and really try to avoid all, a lot of the jargon that maybe comes with, you know, when you talk about networking, you're tempted to use jargon all the time, right? This is what we're, you know, protocol uh, acronyms. Uh, and we wanted to kind of go back to just basics of, you know, what we need the network to do and then apply it to Kubernetes. Um, so I, again, I'm not going to go through all the slides. I've, I've just skipped to slide 26 just to show you. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about this. We, we want you, you know, your, your viewers want to see some demo, but I just wanted to set the scene. Uh, obviously feel free to challenge me, ask any questions any times, right? It's just, um, but I guess when I think about Kubernetes networking and just broader networking, right? W regardless of whether you're talking about physical networking, virtual networking, container networking, cloud networking, you have some requirements, right? You, you want the network to be doing something for you, for your applications. Um, and I'm not going to mention anything for the first minute that is anything Kubernetes related. I'm just talking about the network. Um, so what do we want? We want our applications to have a, an IP address, right? So which is, you know, in the physical network, you have a GHCP server, or, uh, in, you know, IPAM doing this for you, right? We want our applications to be able to talk to our applications. Right. And again, that could be with a routing protocol, which could be with layer two switching in the tr traditional network. I've seen Kubernetes is slightly different. Uh, then we need some kind of, we need the application to be able to access the outside world. It's outbound access. And then we need our applications to be accessible from the outside. Right. That's inbound. Just again, basic stuff. Uh, and we need our applications to be secured and our data protected. Um, Maybe we need some kind of encryption of data in transit, some VPN. Um, we need our applications to be resilient and highly available. So maybe we need some kind of load balancer, right? To that could be a local load balancer or global load balancer. We need our application to be deployed across multiple sites. Um, and again, that's applicable to any network. And we may need to meet some regulatory goals and requirements, FIPS, uh, PCI, uh, GDPR, whatever. We, we, we all, we very often for production workloads, mission critical workloads, we, we may have some requirements. And we may need to, of course, operate troubleshoot the network when things go wrong or when, you know, applications misbehave. Um, and, Again, all this in the traditional network, uh, you, we've needed routers and switches and firewalls and load balancers, um, VPN concentrator, reverse proxy, you know, all these different kind of, uh, you know, physical hardware team that we've put together to meet our requirements. Um, and in the world of Kubernetes, the way it's evolved is that you needed a lot of different tools to be able to to do all these different things. You almost like for each line, you almost have like one different tools. Uh, that's how kind of how it started. And the way it kind of moved now is, is really more towards uh, having a, a universal platform that is able to address all these different requirements. So, um, in uh, the space of the, you know, again, applying this to Kubernetes networking, right? So, what we need, um, you know, to, to recap, we need to something called a CNI, which is a container network interface. And that's responsible for the connectivity of all, of our microservices. And it's responsible for, you know, allocating an IP address, ensuring that pods can, and containers can talk with each other. That's number one. That's kind of basic connectivity. We also need, see the load balancing. Right within within the cluster again across multiple clusters, we need to be able to secure our application uh, with firewall rules. And in Kubernetes, it's something the the equivalent of a uh, say stateful um, access list is network policies. Right, so we need to be able to able to enforce the network policies, and that's uh, again that's the role of the of the network plugin. 
And that's something that um, platforms like Cilium can do. Um, we need to be able to encrypt the traffic between different uh, see, containers and pods as they are located in different nodes. Um, again, if you think about like, you would typically need to, you know, have a VPN over a public site. Um, and in, in the, you know, Kubernetes is often deployed on a public cloud provider, CSPs, and obviously it's a shared underlying network. So you need to, you, you don't trust it. So you need to be able to encrypt the traffic, uh, between your different nodes. And then I talked about inbound access. You need to be able to, uh, route the traffic into your network. Uh, in Kubernetes, we, we talk about ingress, uh, and, or ingress controller to be able to, uh, almost act as a reverse, uh, web proxy, right? So route that HTTP traffic to that service. That's the role of an ingress. Um, you need to be able to connect multiple clusters together and Finally, you need to be able to manage all that network, right? That's, uh, and visualize the traffic and understand, uh, application performance, uh, if there are any drops, uh, packets, latency, that kind of stuff. So all this, uh, as you maybe, if you're familiar with the logo of Cilium is actually, <laughs> sorry for the, the very geeky like PowerPoint slides, but, it makes up uh, is all these different things can be done with Cilium. So any questions so far? I've been talking for a few minutes. That makes sense. Yeah, no, this is this is a really good call out to start out with, right? Because like you said, you can do all these things kind of separately, right? With different tooling within Kubernetes. But this is where something like a CNI plugin is helpful because it can you know, combine a lot of this stuff in, into one tool and you don't have to be an expert in seven different pieces of, <laughs> of Kubernetes to, to get all this working, right? And that's, that's my next point. And if you ask anybody who's been operating Kubernetes cluster for three, four, five years, right, they probably have multiple networking tools. Right? They may have a CNI that could be Fano, Cilium, Calico, Antria, right? And that's all very often at, at the very least for, uh, get IP address management for pure connectivity and to maybe enforce network policies. So just to, to be like a basic, uh, firewall within your cluster. That's one tool. Then some, uh, may have another tool to connect clusters together. Some may have another tool for load balancing. They may have another tool for ingress, for example, nginx, right? That could be that again lets you, um, route like, for example, HTTP traffic, uh, do things like TLS termination, SSL VPN offload. Um, but again, that's a different tool to install, manage, configure. Um, and so I could go on. There are a few other tools that, uh, um, essentially, Again, I've, I've been used by Kubernetes engineers over the past few years f to address some of their networking requirements. Um, which is, and the idea of this, uh, little cartoon here is just to show that the kind of complexity behind having so many different stacks, you know, so many different layers. Uh, and one of the things we are trying to do with, with Cilium is, is really to be like a uni universal networking platform for Cloud native for Kubernetes, and to reduce the number of tools that you may need in a, in the you know to to for your clusters. So this is a very random question. So the the B that shows up in a lot of the Cilium advertising does he have a name? Uh, <laughs> so we we um, we have something called the EB Dex, which is on a. Um, you can find on GitHub, uh, there's a repo called, uh, ebdex with all the, the Bs that we use in our illustrations. Uh, we have a graphic designer who's fantastic and he's been creating a lot of these EBs, uh, for us. So the EBs don't have necessarily a names, but they have like jobs. <laughs> and, uh, so you have the, uh, 
the holiday bee. So you can see this one here. That's a tropical bee. Uh, and then you've got the edit, you know, networking bee, the security bee, observability bee. Um, nice. So uh, yeah, no, it's it's, uh, it's quite a lot of fun to come up with uh, with all these different uh, the backstories of each uh, EB. What what's your what's your favorite? <laughs> what's my favorite? Uh, well, my favorite is uh, is one we we um, it was uh, for one of the release of of um, of Celium that uh, including support for multi network. And multi-network is the idea of you can connect a, a pod, uh, which is essentially, a, again, a, a set of containers. And you can connect a pod to multiple networks, which is by default that kind of, that's not very, not default, but you can't do it in Kubernetes, right? But there are some use cases when you need to connect a pod to multiple network, just like there are use cases where you need to connect a virtual machine to multiple network. Or when you need to connect a server to multiple network, right? You can have like out of band management or whatever. Um, so what I did is I created a sketch of what I wanted the B to look like. And it had to be a, a B holding two cables and plugging into a, a pod. And it was like awful, like terribly because I can't draw myself, <laughs> but I sent my sketch to our graphic designer and he just came up with some, uh, you know, very, uh, uh, attractive picture. So just to say, like it's a there's a creative process uh, happening behind the scene of of uh, of this of these bees. That's awesome. Very nice. <laughs> cool. So um, so one of the again technology that um, powers Serium is something called eBPF. Um, sometimes the way we describe it is uh, this, this is, it's a Linux kernel technology, um, which Sometimes we describe it as a, what JavaScript is to the browser, eBPF is to the Linux kernel. It's a way to run uh, custom scripts, essentially custom programs in the kernel, uh, but securely and efficiently. Uh, so again, typically the Linux kernel is uh, something that is very fixed and cannot be uh, modified, changed very quickly. Uh, so if you want to add like fit networking features, for example, security features, you typically have to wait for the kernel to be updated. It can take a long time. Um, and eBPF lets us run uh, custom programs at different points uh, in the networking data stack within the Linux kernel. Um, another way to explain it and an uh, explanation I like to use is um, thinking about the Cisco Catalyst at is 6500 so you guys are maybe familiar with a with a good old 6500 yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah and if you remember you we used to have these uh, service modules oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> so you used to be able to insert in your in your switch had like you know 9 13 mod modules and you had the switching ports but you also had the service modules where you could insert it and it provides a function right it was like a you could do application firewall, you could do load balancer, you can do lots of different things. And eBPF is almost a way to insert, it's, it's almost like service module for the Linux kernel, where you can insert a custom program into your network. Um, but at a, you know, and in, insert it straight into the data plane. So you have like high performance, uh, but almost kind of seamlessly insert these uh, network functions into your, into your network switch. So that's, that's my explanation for, uh, you know, network engineers who, uh, who have lived and, uh, um, appreciated uh, the joys of, of the Catalyst 60, 6500. I think that's a good, yeah. It, in the, the recent book that you published, I think it was, you made a good call out that while eBPF is what powers Cilium to do pretty much everything that it does, um, it's it's a it's an underlying tool that you know even the networkers typically don't even have to touch. Like uh, I've been working in networking for what fifteen twenty years now, and I I couldn't tell you how an ASIC is programmed. Don't know, don't care, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, you don't yeah. necessarily need to know sometimes, you know. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's the same kind of, uh, yeah, same, same argument. So some people like to understand how it works. It's part of the, you know, the secret source. Um, I have some basic understanding. Many of my colleagues are experts, 
and some of them are literally created in BPF. Uh, but, and that, and that was one of the appeals of, of I surveyed on Cisco is the fact that we you know many of our, the founders of eBPF and the uh, industry leaders uh, work for Isovalent uh, because it's just enabling some very cool use cases for including Cilium. Yeah, I I like the uh, so the last the last slide where you were talking about how you know here we had to manage all of these different packages and uh, you know they kind of created the tooling that we replaced with Cilium. I was going to ask at that time, but I'm glad I didn't because this explained it, which is how Cilium differed from that. Because, I mean, packages are individual Linux. Like, they they don't look, work at the kernel level, right? They're just like one yeah. little tool that you install, install, install. And that's why you've got this stack there that's replaced by Cilium. So, yeah, I totally get it. Yeah. That, that's, yeah. Again, that's, that's for me. Um like, For me, there are a few different, you know, appealing aspects to Cilium. Um some people like the fact that it's kind of high performance and we, the way we do networking within the Linux networking stack, uh, through eBPF means that we bypass a lot of the internal Linux circuitry, uh, which is, which is cool and it's kind of high performance. But from a more practical aspect, I like the fact that Celium removes the need for additional tools. Right. Um, so. Before I go through a, a demo, I just wanted to just set some context about what I'm going to show you. Um, and again, um, then we'll go into a demo, but I'll just, just show you a couple more slides and then, uh, uh, we show some, some, my, my, my terminal. Um, and again, this is, uh, the slides I use at KubeCon just to explain something that tends to intimidate a lot of engineers is, uh, the network policy. Again, that's, as I mentioned, for more like networking folks, it's the way we uh, implement micro-segmentation because by default, you deploy your Kubernetes cluster. The uh, the intent is that all the pods can talk to each other, right? There's no, there's no nothing. There's no, everything can just talk. There's no, you know, um, rules. So the way to enforce micro-segmentation is through network policies. Uh, you have something called the Kubernetes network policy, Kubernetes network policy that are pretty basic. And then you have the Cilium network policies that are a bit more advanced. And um, just real quick, um, yeah. to call that out, like that is default behavior. It's not Nico saying like, we want to set it up this way, right? It's default behavior within Kubernetes that everything yeah. is allowed to talk to everything because yeah, networking absolutely. people are going to hear that and be like, why? <laughs> right. <laughs> so just want to make, make that clear. <laughs> Yeah, it's part of the networking model of, of Kubernetes. Um, and yeah, we, and that's one of the primary reasons where that, you know, people will start adopting, uh, CNIs like, uh, Calico or Cilium is that, uh, these CNIs support network policies. Right? There are some that just don't support it. They can only do, uh, say IP connectivities that don't do the network policies. Um, so that's one of the main use case for, for say, Cilium to begin with. And it's to, again, uh, deploy security roles. Now, um, security roles should be, uh, if you think about security role, you have to decide, you know, kind of in which direction that you, you, you apply. If you think about the, the doing ACL on your, on your Cisco router or switches, uh, you know, you decide the direction, you decide, uh, who the, the, you know, the traffic, uh, applies to. Uh, so here we are using labels. Um, and it's essentially instead of using IP addresses, we tend to use labels in, um, uh, in Kubernetes because, uh, pods are always spawned and, uh, deployed and destroyed. IP addresses change all the time. They're not predictable. So we use metadata and labels to essentially enforce security in our cluster. Uh, and I, I, I guess I cover this, I think, in, in, in the bot podcast. So don't spend too much time and I'm sure you want to see the demo. Um, but what we have here essentially is a network policy that says, uh, I want to um, allow traffic to my my pods, which are, I have this label, which is a Death Star pod, right? Also the, the demo is inspired by Star Wars. 
Um, and I want my, my TIE fighter to be able to communicate with my Death Star over port 80, right? That's just, this is what this network policy is saying. Uh, because they are part of the same organization, they're part of the empire, they are allowed to talk to each other. Um, then we have another example, which is, but it's going to, in the other direction, it's going in egress, right? So I want my TIE fighters to be able to talk to the outside world. I want them to be able to uh, access um, some, well, the, the Death Star as well. But also, uh, we use something called uh, FQDN-based um, network policies and say, I want the, my TIE fighter to be able to connect to Disney.com or, or the, the Star Wars API.dev. Um, and that's one of the appeal of the Cilium network policies. We're able to do FQDN-based uh, network policy and not just based on IP addresses, uh, which is really uh, appealing when you do APIs, right? So instead of using IP addresses, you can just say, I want this microservice to be able to access this API um, and by using FQDN-based uh, kind of network policy, you can really specify which API your service is allowed to call. Okay. And I think, I think this may come in later, but so obviously this is, you know, allowing or restricting traffic to an outbound FQDN. Is, is there a capability to also do URLs? So if you want to be more specific with the path. Yeah. Yeah. You can do path. You can do uh, the HTTP path. You can do the method to so say, I'll, I'll, you know, I want to allow um, traffic to only like get post yeah. um, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, you can you know get more and more sophisticated, and you, we can also add some mutual authentication um, to the mix so that your two endpoints verify each other's identity. Um, there are lots of kind of again different layers of granularity and security you can add to the mix. Right, that's cool. Cool. Uh, we're going to show this in the demo. The other things I wanted to briefly talk about before the demo is uh, the concept of ingress and web proxy. Well, it's more like a reverse web proxy. Um, so again, you have to think about like uh, your cluster is like an island where you'll deploy your applications and then you want your applications to be accessible, right? That's just the, the idea around <laughs> deploying your microservices. Um, Initially, the way um, community supported this with was through something called the Ingress Controller, uh, which again it was was a dedicated tool. A very common one was Nginx Ingress, um, and it is now being replaced by something called a Gateway Gateway API. Now, the Ingress uh, there again there were lots of different tools using uh, Ingress, but it became uh, Obsolete. Be, the, the API specification uh, wasn't safe, flexible enough. So what happens is that uh, uh, again, I'm going to skip some 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 history here. But uh, Gateway API became the new standard for um, routing traffic into your cluster. So for example, if I uh, make a request to say my domain name here slash foo, you can for that HTTP request you can send that traffic to the containers that is hosting the foo service. Right. And if you make that uh, same, you know, whether it's HTTP or HTTPS, you can terminate the, the TLS connection at the gateway itself. You can send that traffic to slash bar. Uh, to the to the to the container that is hosting the bar service, you can even use the gateway to help you redirect. So if you've done a migration, you can uh, send uh, redirect three hundred two or three hundred one code to your client. Uh, we support gRPC as well, so it's not just kind of um, you know, standard HTTP uh, calls. And what you'll see in the demo is something called, a, we can also introduce some uh, new applications. So you could say, 
I want to introduce this beta version of my application for you know, A-B testing, canary testing. So the gateway API can essentially send 1% of your traffic or whatever, you can, you can set this up, 10% of your traffic to a new version of your application so you can test the behavior as you, um, you know, as you deploy a new beta version of your applications. Um, so, that's a, yeah. So Nico, this actually reminds me a little bit, well, a lot of it. Uh, and, th- and to be clear, this is the gateway IP for Cilium, right? This is the, this is not like the Kubernetes. This is. So, so gateway API is like, um, it's a sub project of the, um, of the special interest group within the, uh, Kubernetes platform. Okay. Uh, and it's supported by, again, lots of different vendors. There are maybe about 20, 25 implementations of gateway API. Cilium supports it natively. So you, if you use Cilium for the basic networking, almost as your switch, uh, you can also activate the gateway function within Cilium so that it, it also acts as a, as, as a essentially entry point into your cluster. Okay. And my follow up to that is that it just, it, the, I mean, of course it would, I guess, but the, it reminds me a lot of like, uh, the, the native CSP application gateway services, right? Like very, very close to that up. Yeah. It, and it's, it's kind of, it's, it's called gateway API and it sometimes overlaps a bit with what an API gateway does, right? Just, it tends to do a lot of the similar things and, a lot of the CSPs have API gateway, right? For, um, you know, again, that's, that's what you deploy your application on EC2 and then yeah. you want something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not like, so the, the ways you're interacting with the gateway API and you would with a CSP native API, I mean, it's, that's driven by the fact that that's how the apps work. Right. So, so totally, totally get it. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, uh, let's go into a demo. There, I've got a few use cases I, I want to, to show you, uh, walk you through. Um, can you still see my screen? <laughs> it's, it's uh, yeah, I was going to say it's a little small. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Now, Is that yeah. okay now? Yeah, it looks great yeah. now. Okay. Awesome. So, um, and all this, I'm, uh, I'm using, uh, our labs. So if you, uh, if you go on isovenant.com, you will see we've got um, slash labs. We've got 33 labs that are free online. Um, only thing you have to do is put your the marketing data, but, uh, and you have a fresh, uh, Kubernetes cluster deployed for you and you can test lots of different use cases and features of Cilium. Um, some of them are, you know, things that more advanced networking stuff like BGP and multicast. There are some labs that are more around migration um, and some that are more around security. And so I've got one that I've I created for my, my KubeCon demo. I'm going to walk you through, but uh, again, if your viewers are interested, uh, they can go and uh, try out these labs uh, later on. Yeah. And the yeah. labs are awesome. If you haven't gone through any of them, like they, you guys did a really good job creating these. Yeah, they're, I, they're really I cool. haven't been able to make the time, but I'm going to make the time. I've been pushing it off and pushing it off. I need to, I need to do it because these look really cool. These labs look really good. They are cool, and and, and I'm watching it. I know who's taking the labs, so I'll be looking out for you. So uh, all right, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I my LinkedIn feed is like constantly a stream of people getting the badges for for labs <laughs> for the Cilium yeah, labs yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we do we do give, we we uh, we give out some labs we we have a um, for most of these labs we we have a little challenge some of for some of them the challenge is actually quite hard where and then you get like a digital badge at the end of it you can share on LinkedIn oh nice um, and right. I mean yeah the, the the advanced BGP lab is a, is a, is a good one with you know you've got to do some like you know configure some communities and uh MD5 password and you know do all the kind of BGP advanced configuration that uh yeah you know, for maybe network engineers that's quite straightforward but for some of the more like platform engineers it's a bit harder but oh yeah 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and even though you can configure BGP all day as a network engineer, you might not, you, you really need to learn like, how does that matter? Why do you, when do you need that in Kubernetes? I think that's the piece that matters for us, right? When do I need to yeah. use it? When, how do I use it? And, and using it in YAML as well, right? <laughs> you don't tend oh, to do yeah. that in your... <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So, um, so what I've got here in, in my environment is I've got uh, a Kubernetes cl clusters. It's running three nodes, uh, one control play node, two worker nodes. Um, and it's a small uh, Kubernetes in Docker uh, kind uh, cluster, which is what we use for, for our labs and our demo. But it's running Selium, and we have some um, uh, something called the Selium CLI, which is like a little binary you can install. And it lets you interact with uh, Kubernetes API server and just and the Selium agents and just checks the overall status of the installation of Selium and the operation of Selium. So just again, for example, here we've got, uh, we know that Selium is healthy uh, and we've got uh, uh, a number of pods have been deployed. We know the Selenium is running with version 114, uh, which is quite quite a recent version. Uh, so we've got a cluster. Selenium has been deployed, and and now we we've got uh, we're going to start deploying our galactic applications. Um, so what we've done is. Um, we, we have a, a namespace, which again in Kubernetes is kind of a, not quite like a VLAN or it's not quite like a VRF, but it's some kind of isolation of resources, right? Typically, like you have a tenant in a namespace, maybe an application in, in its own namespace. Um, so. I mean, are we talking like Linux namespace, like that, that kind of namespace or different than that even? It's, a, it's different from the Linux namespaces, but it's a similar kind of kind of similar concept. Uh, so for example, here we've got um, uh, the cube system namespace, which is like one of the default one, which is like the administrative namespace. Uh, the end, you have the default where if you don't specify uh, your namespace, this is where you will operate. So if I do a kubectl get pods in, if I don't specify anything, it will look into the default namespace and I don't have anything deployed there. Uh, but what I've got is I went uh, and deployed some pods in the Endor namespace. And as you can see, I've got a Death Star, I've got a TIE Fighter, and I've got an X-Wing. Um, and uh, as they can see, they're, they're ready, they're running, they're happy, they've been, uh, again, they've been deployed successfully. Um, and if, um, yeah, they're, they're, all, they're all working, they're all working fine. Um, now we're just going to, uh, see, um, what I've also done is, uh, remember that I was showing you the network policies. Yeah. And the network policies, uh, essentially enable access from, uh, my TIE fighter, my Empire ship to talk to the Death Star. Uh, but the X-Wing is not going to be able to, to, um, to access because we want to, Prevent, uh, the rebels from accessing the Death Star and to, from blowing up the Death Star. In, uh, in our, in our universe of, uh, Sodium and Star Wars, we, we tend to be the bad guys. We tend to, uh, you know, we want to protect the, 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 the Death Star from, from, uh, from the rebels. So I, um, created some, uh, Sodium network policy. And I've got three network policies, and I was uh, that's the one I, I showed in my uh, my slide before, and I can even show you in uh, what they look like in YAML. But um, so I have one that uh, is here, uh, and what it does is it uh, applies to the Death Star, and it allows traffic from. Uh, the TIE fighter and, um, well, it allowed traffic from pods with the TIE fighter label and from right. with the Empire label, right? Again, it's all, we're not using IP addressing, we're using labels because that's the way, uh, we create our kind of identity. And Nico, real quick, when you, yeah. the labels are applied or, or applied to the pods, I guess, on creation of the, of the pod itself, right? 
So that's not here, yes. obviously. That's all done for you, but just for so everybody under, understands. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess one of the benefits as well is if, you know, if I need to scale up, you know, I need to deploy more, more containers, but um, because of there's lots of traffic, uh, so I want more replicas of my pods, almost like you're, if you're cloning virtual machine, you, you want to do the same because there's lots of demand. So you might want to go and um, scale up and deploy mo more pods, uh, but that are essentially identical copies. Uh, if I deploy them with the same manifest um, and the same labels, they will pick up the same identity. So they will be automatically uh, secured using the same, you know, biases network policy because again, yeah. because we are using the light ladder base. So, um, they yeah, have that the makes a lot identity. of sense. Cool. So we got our network policy. So the first thing we, we, I wanted to show you is, um, and, oh yeah, you asked before as well. Um, can I do HTTP based, uh, things? So for example, here, my network policy is only allowing traffic, a post, I see that. A post and over the slash v1 request landing. Oh, that's very cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that is really so nice. When I, so by using the command here, what I'm doing is I'm entering the shell of the TIE fighter. And from the TIE fighter, I'm doing a curl post to the desktop over the v1 slash request landing. And I get a ship landed, which is uh, essentially successful. 200 location. Okay. 200 okay. Now, if I try to do the same thing from uh, the X wing, right? Common terminated with exit code 28. So I have a connect timeout of one, so we don't have to wait, which means that uh, my X wing is not able to access my desktop. Why? Makes sense. Because if I look at the labels here, my TIE fighter had the org empire and class TIE fighter um, here, lab uh, labels that we saw earlier here. So when I was that one here, class TIE fighter, org empire. And, uh, and again, just to be clear, um, yeah. because I... I the labels themselves are not part of of Cilium or anything else. The, the labels are create, or are they? Are the the labels are created when you create the pod, right? It's not part of that. You just reference those labels in the network policy, or is it not the case? So the labels are Kubernetes labels, um, right? Okay, they are just a, a form of metadata, and they can be used by uh, yeah by by Kubernetes by Cilium. Uh, so we use them to essentially create the identity, uh, uh, identity ID, uh, and we should be able to uh, see. Yeah, the re the reason I ask is just because, of course, the um, obviously this demo is focused very much on on Cilium and network policy, but uh, I didn't want I want to make sure people aren't confused about where those labels actually, first of all, came from, but also. Like yeah. what, what, I guess what made them and, and how we are referencing them. So thanks. Yeah. And we, we essentially create an identity based on the labels. Uh, and that's, as you can see here, this is the identity ID of, uh, some of our, some of the objects. Uh, and again, that, that's how we then relate to, to network policies. Network policy are, are based on these identities and not, not based on, on, on an IP address. Right. Um, so, okay, now I've got some, uh, I've got my network policies. I know that my, uh, my TIE fighter can talk to my X-Wing, my, my, to my desktop, my X-Wing cannot talk because it hasn't got the right label. Uh, what I wanted to show you is something, uh, it's around like verifying, right? So we have a tool called Hubble and that comes with Serium, which is our observability, network observability, uh, platform. And it's a kind of mix between Wireshark, NetFlow, uh, TCP dump, before Kubernetes. Um, and it's a way, again, it's kind of using eBPF under the hood to look at traffic flows and look at uh, 
who's talking to who, uh, how many bytes, latencies, and all sorts of information and data. Um, so what I can do is use Hubble Observe to say, okay, I want to see all the traffic from my pod uh, X-Wing in the namespace Endor to my pod Death Star in the namespace Endor. And I'm using this filter here, which is uh, the type of traffic. See, I'm just looking for drops. Um, and what we can see here is all the traffic that has been dropped. So, uh, you know, that traffic, when I run, if you recall, when I run that command and traffic was dropped, that's, uh, that's exactly the one we've just done here. And we, I also have a, a script in the background running this. That's why we see more entry, but, um, Hubble is able to, uh, just like TensorFlow is able to, to show me all the kind of, uh, the traffic between different endpoints. Uh, and by using some of the filters I was showing you, I can say, I really want to look for a specific flow. Like why is the, why is the traffic drop between A and B? Um, so here I can use, you know, uh, keywords like from pod to pod. Um, I can even look for, uh, so if you look at the, at the help here, I'd say, if I only want to look for traffic with um, uh, HTTP status 404, 503, you know, or 200, you know, that's for example, for status. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really nice. And amazing. you can, yeah, you can go all the way to, you know, HTTP paths, HTTP method, uh, and be super, super granular. Um, so I, this, yeah. this might be a dumb question, but, um, so is the, is the requirement for a specific tool like Hubble, uh, to see this kind of data, is that, is that required because you need to actually see this stuff getting dropped at the kernel level versus, um, at maybe the Nick level, I guess, I don't even know, I don't even know if you'd call it the Nick level at, at this, uh, at this stage, but, uh, is, is that the, what warrants that? Uh, yeah. I mean, you could also have. Yeah, pods in within in the same on the same host, like with traffic not even leaving the NIC, right? Yeah, so, true. Right. Um, yeah. So you've got to yeah cater for all these kind of use cases. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, I mean it's super super powerful, um, and it comes with a with a CLI and it comes with a, a user interface, uh, which again you can. Um, we're going to go in the endom namespace. So it's just a, a service. Oh, nice. So map. web front end, right? It's yeah. like a web front end for this app. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can show you what, uh, you know, the traffic that uh, has been observed. Um, so you could say, for example, we've got all the traffic from my TIE fighter to, uh, you know, from my X wing to, uh, these different APIs um, from my TIE fighter to the desktop. Um, and you can even see, see again, things like, oh yeah, the, the HTTP path and, and post and all the labels filter based on the verdict, whether traffic was forwarded or dropped. So you remember, you can see the X wing, the traffic from the X wing was dropped because it didn't have the right label. Uh, you can filter by, um, namespaces. Um, and I mean, so you can even see here what we actually don't, um, don't show you any of the IP addresses. Uh, it's optional. You can, you know, we can put it in there, uh, source IP, destination IP. Uh, but again, in Kubernetes, not always useful or relevant because IP addresses can, Always change. This has like everything. <laughs> Earlier, I was about I was going to ask if it showed you which policy, but then you pulled up all the the stuff, and it's got everything you could possibly want information on. Does it do TCP? The, the only thing missing, I think, is the TCP dump itself, and it's pretty damn close already. Um, yeah. So we um, we don't have yet. Uh, an integration with the ability to say create a pick up from 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 this um 
I've seen some some prototypes. I'm sure that might eventually some stuff might 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 come along. But um, typically, um, you know, it's in many of our labs, actually in the BGP labs, what we tend to do is we tend to deploy a pod and uh, and run TCP dump on that pod, or even on the sodium agent, and capture the traffic, and we run. Um, Term Shark, which is like the Linux version of, of Wireshark and show you some of the, the BGP packets. But yeah, for me, it's like, uh, you know, feature request is I, w- I would love to have this direct integration with, with, with TCP dump. I mean, cause this is already really close. I mean, now this is of course focused entirely on, uh, policy, right? Like this is a policy, uh, with the verdict and all of that. Um, that's what I was asking. Cause I mean, you even can show the, the, um, the application level level stuff with the you know HTTP gets and posts and and all of that that's yeah. really nice yeah yeah um, and that's that's in all all I'm showing you right now is all in the open source version by the way because it's um, see iSovern has an enterprise edition of Selium that comes with more features um, uh, this is just the op- the open source stuff uh, so that's that's how that's how I got started with Selium about three years ago. Uh, deployed this on my my little lab and and uh, Hubble UI was like what kind of wow this is pretty cool <laughs> it is very cool yeah agreed well, one one last quick question relating to the uh, I guess the the FKDN filtering that you're doing is this is this at all limited by versions of TLS uh, like is this relying on an SNI um, to get this data or uh, so we, we have some integration with, um, with TLS where you can, um, you know, like almost intercept the traffic and be like a, if like you, a yeah, proxy right. or man in the middle type yeah. thing. Yeah yeah. 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 Where you, you can uh, import the certificate and then, uh, have the kind of level of visibility. Um, gotcha. Yeah. That's really useful. TLS proxy. That's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple more things I wanted to show you. Uh, yeah, please. So the next one was going to be. So I wanted, I talked about the gateway API. Um, and I touched on this quite briefly, but, um, it was really about, I would say a reverse web proxy. Um, and it was about the ability to say, I want, uh, to bring typically HTTP traffic into my cluster and I want to send all the traffic based on a, on a path towards, uh, a backend container or a backend servers. Um, and with gateway API support, Cilium can, without the need for another tool, you know, push traffic to, um, um, so, to to a, to a backend, and what I'm going to show you is this kind of ability to um, root traffic and also to load balance traffic. So, uh, one thing I've got, so I've deployed my gateway and has uh, this IP address one seven two dot eighteen dot two five five dot two four, which is like almost like my semi external facing IP address, um, and that's my. My terminal is essentially an external client and I'm going to send HTTP traffic to that IP address and that traffic will then reach its destination. So, um, and I'm using, uh, the gateway API specification here and, uh, what we're going to do here is if I send that traffic to, uh, and you can see there's this uh, slash, uh, it's empty here. So, any traffic to, uh, if I don't specify the path, all the traffic to the gateway will be sent to my desktop service. Um, so, and you can see a weight of the weight of one. So essentially hundred percent of my traffic will be sent to my desktop backend. Um, but my service has a, um, I actually have a, uh, two pods. So what I'm, I'm going to do afterwards is, um, I'm going to then introduce some load balancing. 
and I'm going to introduce some, a new version of my application and see if traffic is balanced between, um, f- you know, some traffic goes to my existing application and some traffic goes to my new application. So that's going to, yeah. So first I'm just going to start by, um, I'm running a, just a, a loop, um, where I'm sending, I'm running this, this command in a loop 200, uh, times and I'm doing a curl from my machine to the IP address I was showing you here, which is, uh, 255.204. And I'm saving this into this, uh, this, Yep. text file. And then I just do um, a grep and I'm, I'm looking for how many. So um, the, the answer I get from the server has the name of its pod. So it's an echo server. So it tells me who is receiving uh, the packet. So 200 queries. Of the 200 queries, 200 went to the first star and zero went to the second star because I have not done any kind of load balancing. Now, uh, what I'm going to do now is deploy uh, a 90-10 route where 90% of my traffic is going to go to my desktop and 10% is going to go to my desktop too. So I'm again, I'm introducing a, a new version of my desktop because the first desktop is not secure. It's been blown up by the rebels. The rebels have captured the plant. So we need to come up with a new desktop with, you know, that is bulletproof. Um, so I'm running the same tests and I'm saving it to a different file. And again, and what I'm expecting here is roughly 90% of my traffic to be sent to my existing application and 10% to be, you know, sent to my, uh, backup application. Does that make sense in terms of the? Yeah, definitely. Use case, mm-hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So, and, and I'm it's just so short. This. I mean, here we go. Your that file, the YAML file, is so short to make. Like, it's just so easy to to do this. It looks like. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really just uh, the only thing we need to specify is uh, the host names um, because we uh, we're actually using a. TLS um, get away. So we're terminating the, the the TLS connection. As you can see, I'm doing a HTTPS to my uh, to my desktop. So we're doing a, yep. a TLS termination at the gateway. And then from the gateway over to the service, it's over HTTP. Um, so you can see that, yeah, about uh, 18%. Yeah, but- yeah, you know, well, nine nine percent of my traffic. So it's not it's not always super precise, but roughly ten percent of the traffic was sent to my new application, and ninety percent has been sent to my current one. Yep, that makes sense. That's okay. really cool. Makes sense. Do I have time to show you some BGP? Uh, we we'll, oh, we'll course. make time for BGP. I mean, we're all yeah, network engineers here. <laughs> awesome. So. Uh, just to conclude on the gateway API, uh, again, built in, built in within Cilium. Uh, so if you use Cilium for, uh, your basic networking, you can just activate this feature later on and it lets you bring your, your web proxy. Uh, right. So I'm going to show you the Ga- BGP. Real quick, gateway API is yeah. pretty new, right? Yes. So, um, and while we wait for this other lab to boot, I can, I can explain a bit more. Um, so the, the the problem with the gateway API is yeah it's just uh, the version one point zero only came out about five six months ago it was it was in beta until then um, and the first iteration of uh, was was called ingress and the the p- problem with ingress is that uh, all these different vendors again they could have been you know, issue or nginx or whatever lots of different vendors. Uh, Kong, um, they're implemented in a different manner, uh, which is not, not their fault, but they, they had, they had to do it to support also different use cases like TLS termination, uh, TLS path through, whichever kind of use case. And they ended up with different ways of supporting 
ingress routing into the cluster. And so we ended up in a situation where if you had to migrate from one implementation to another, uh, it was a nightmare because the configuration was just really different from one to another. So, you know, the example I use in the book is if you're trying to copy the configuration from your Juniper switch and, you know, paste it into Cisco and expecting it to work, it just doesn't. Um, and Gateway API, one of the design, one of the idea behind it was to really offer like a standard version of, okay, this is how we do ingress into a Kubernetes cluster. Okay. All right. So, um, BGP, Kubernetes. So, uh, again, this is like, uh, something that we see more in, uh, maybe not, you know, in, in cloud managed, uh, Kubernetes. So you're not going to see this as much in EKS or GKE or AKS. It's more if you're running Kubernetes on premise and you want to, uh, connect your cluster, which from a networking perspective is almost like a black box. Um, so you want to be able to connect your cluster to the rest of your existing network, right? You might want your virtual machine or, you know, some box connected to your Cisco ACI fabric or whatever to access applications running in your cluster. Um, and one thing that we can do with, with Cilium is to, is for Cilium to run BGP with your top of fact device and advertise to the rest of your network, the IP ranges used within your Kubernetes cluster. That makes sense. So it's just essentially a cluster is like a spoke and you connect to the hub using BGP. Just that's just all, all there is to it. Cool. So, uh, again, I've got a new lab and, um, I'm going to go and, um, create, uh, connect my, uh, environment to, um, the, uh, my cluster to, uh, the rest of the network. And for this, we're using a, a really cool tool called, uh, Container Lab. I don't know if you guys have come across it. Oh, yeah. Container Lab yeah, is amazing. Container Lab's great. Yeah. Right. Wow, awesome. Um, so we're using Container Lab to, uh, simulate our virtual, um, you know, network infrastructure. So, and we even can show here some of the, um, um, App, the, the, okay, so the network topology. So I, maybe for people not familiar with, with Container Lab, it's like, Terraform uh, infrastructure as code meets like virtual, like GNS3 or, um, essentially it's a way to deploy virtual networking based on a topology defined as YAML. Um, so what here, what is, is going to deploy is a virtual networking and, um, it's running, uh, FRR for, uh, our virtual networking, uh, daemon. And we're going to build BGP, uh, BGP peering session between the Kubernetes cluster running, you know, using Cilium and the virtual device deploy, deploy through container lab. And that's another representation here is we've got a Kubernetes cluster here. Uh, it's just one cluster, but imagine there are two racks, uh, with couple of different nodes and we're going to be running PGP sessions with a top of fact device and a top of fact device may be running PGP with a core um, infrastructure. Right. So in that regard, are you, are you always running BGP adjacencies pretty much at the node level? Yes. So the, the Cilium um, agents, which is, uh, there are, uh, what we're going to see in a sec is Cilium is, um, um, to, to be like the networking overlay and we deploy a network, a Cilium agent. That's kind of the, your data that builds the data, data plane. And there's one Cilium agent per node. And on 
all of the nodes or on specific nodes, you can enable the BGP functionality. Typically, maybe, you know, you don't want all the Kubernetes nodes to be running BGP. You just want right. a couple of them, right? Yeah. So we're going to uh, um, only, again, using labels, we're going to say only the nodes with these labels will be running PGP with our top of five device. So I am running Container Lab to deploy my virtual network uh, super quick. Um, and so I've got my kind of back backbone being created. Um, and if I access my routers, my, my virtual router, my FRR device, I can see some, some BGP sessions are, are up and running. Um, but my top of rack device, uh, it's trying to connect to the Cilium nodes, but the sessions are not established because I've not, uh, enabled Cilium or I've not even enabled, um, BGP on my nodes. So the sessions right. are not, are not coming up. So by, uh, you know, a couple of minutes, we're going to enable BGP on this. And, and like you said, we don't really see this. I mean, because of course, you know, the CSP is going to manage a lot of this, uh, EKS, EKS, GK. Um, this is going to be more for like on-prem deployments of, of Kubernetes, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, in the, yeah, I guess in the cloud, you might use more like a transit gateway or some VPC peering and all some other things like this, but. Yeah, but it, but if you deploy, the reason I'm asking is because if you deploy, so let's say you don't use AKS, let's say you you know deploy your Kubernetes by some other mm -hmm. non-managed version, which almost nobody does in the cloud. To be fair, um, yeah. you could you know because uh, it it'll have a you know Cilium will have an ENI or or, or NIC or whatever the yeah. you know the CSP is gonna. So you could do the same thing where you create a BGP peering with uh, some kind of NVA, right? Some kind of network virtual appliance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you you could. It's uh yeah, it depends on your tolerance for, for pain. <laughs> 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 but yeah, you 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 can I mean I, I know a lot of um, people actually like, you running like a Kubernetes on, on EC2 doing it themselves instead of using EKS. But yeah, it's uh not that anybody really does that, to be fair. I mean, I'm, <laughs> you don't really hear about that very much. No, no, no yeah, definitely less uh, less these days. But EKS is not actually that old. I think it's only like five years old, but uh, it's, it's definitely, you know, the probably the most popular ones these days. Well, and also, I mean, I think all three of those uh, GKE, AKS, EKS have all said that they use Cilium, right, for their CNI. Yeah, so GK was the first one. Uh, and, uh, yeah, good, good, good shout out. So, um, GK data path V2, which is like almost a standard nowadays is using Cilium. Um, EKS anywhere, which is a distribution of, uh, EKS on premise is using Cilium. Right. And then, uh, AKS, um, is now is, is kind of converging to using Cilium by default. Uh, but yeah, many, many EKS users will remove the Amazon, uh, VPC CNI and install Cilium instead. Uh, you know, for example, because of the network policy support or for, you know, some of the other features we offer. Yeah. I've cool. actually so, heard that quite a few times that people do that. So yeah. Yeah. So what I was talking about was just installing Cilium. So remember I, I had a Cilium CLI, it's kind of little tool, almost like the iOS CLI, but for Cilium. So I've installed Cilium, uh, I can specify the version. I can specify, uh, for example, to enable the BGP functionality and a couple of flags that, uh, I'm going to just skip over now, but I just wanted to show you that Cilium has been installed and the BGP feature has been enabled. And uh, what I will just do now is show you what uh, the PGP configuration looks like. Um, it's uh, the way we do it in, again, in Kubernetes and in, it's through, through YAML, of course. And it's uh, using something called a, a Cilium BGP peering policy. Um, so 
you were asking me about, you know, which, which nodes are running BGP. So again, we can use labels to say on the, on the nodes, um, and it should work. Oops. No. Uh, if I show you the nodes, um, you can see they've got different labels and some of no labels like rack equals rack zero. So on this one, uh, we will enable this PGP configuration. So the local S number will be 65010. Export port CIDR is essentially a way to say, uh, all the network uh, IP ranges where my pod are running. I want to export them, advertise them to the rest of the network. Uh, and here is the IP address of the peer and the remote uh, you know, AS number. And same here, so my, my rack one is in a different AS number and it's peering with a, with a different node. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a very basic peering policy, uh, you know, if you look at some of our other labs, we've got things like, yeah, community and BGP timers, graceful restart. Um, you know, we've got, uh, BFDs coming to our enterprise release, uh, in, in, uh, in the summer. I was going to ask. So, Perfect. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. No, it's a BFD is, uh, is, yeah, it's kind of a, uh, it was uh, as a frequently as with you, but yeah, yeah. That's, that's for for this type of deployment, you wouldn't. It would be yeah. I can see. So, um, not not to derail you too much, but obviously, I see in this in this particular configuration, you're just exporting the entire pod cider, which can be an entire you know subnet um, related to a pod, right? But with, as we've talked about before, these are ephemeral services that get spun up and spun down on a, on a pretty regular basis. So they're using a lot of slash 32 addresses. Is there any rhyme or reason or, or capability where you could advertise slash 32s per service, you know, or, or is it better to just do the pod side or what, what have you kind of seen in the, in the field, I guess? Um, so yeah, hundred percent. So we, um, and we, we, and maybe I'm not sure if this is still live. Um, um, if you give me one sec, I'll show you another one. Um, but sure. um, this one should be, I think that should be preloaded. So they should come on immediately. Here we go. Um, So here, what we've got is a, so sorry, it's a different lab and, uh, and it's actually running IPv6. Um, yeah, see that. So we're paying over IPv6 with a, a different, um, a different node. And actually, Cilium was initially built with IPv6 only. And, uh, because the guys were, you know, very ambitious, very kind of looking, looking forward and, uh, eventually they, they realized that the world was not quite ready for IPv6. So they added IPv4, uh, support for, for Stadium generally. Uh, but what a story we don't... to go backwards. <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> yeah. that's quite, that's quite rare. Uh, and it's been quite a few features that were available first for IPv6 before, before IPv4. Um, uh, but I, what I wanted to show you is, is here what we are doing is we, we are also announcing to our peer, the pod IP range, but uh, it's not really a best practice, to be honest. The, be the better practice is to announce the service IP. And the service is, is more something that is uh, has a more fixed and uh, IP address instead of, and it's fronting, it's like your virtual IP, right? That is fronting your uh, your servers in, 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 in your, if you think about like the load and, balancer IP or something like basically yeah, the, yeah. Front end, the front end IP of the load balancer or something like that. That's, that's the one. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, no, not Kubernetes. Sorry. Kubectl. And we maybe in and I'll try it. Maybe I've skipped. Or skip something in here. Um, so anyway, what I wanted to show you was just the fact that we can 
essentially um, announced a service on announced the IP address of a service based on a on a label uh, using again using a selector so that you are advertising the IP address of a or like almost like the fixed IP address of a of a of a virtual IP instead of advertising lots of you know IP addresses of pods that again may change at at any time. Right. Yeah, that's clear uh, anyway. Yeah. Um, and so just to finish off this initial demo, uh, so I'm going to go and deploy my peering policy and then what we can now see is run this again. Oops. Here we go. So you can see that, uh, my top of right, so if I run a show BGP IP for summary wide from my top of right device, you can see that the BGP session has just come up, right? With my Cilium uh, um, nodes. And we are receiving one prefix, which is the pod CIDR, so the yep. IP range of our um, for our pods. So BGP has been established and then in the rest of the, day, of the lab, you can deploy some networking pods and, you know, test kind of end to end connectivity. Uh, but again, that was just to show you that, uh, Cilium has built in, uh, BGP support. And if you're a network engineer, a lot of it should feel quite, you know, straightforward in terms of, uh, the ability to, um, yeah, just build PGP peering session with uh, yeah. with your rest of the network. I mean, FRR, I've played with it, and it feels just like any routing device I've ever used. Right, like it right. supports supports all the RFCs. Like it's it's a beautiful, honestly, it's a beautiful system. FRR is great. All right, it's brilliant. We we don't we don't actually use FRR ourselves. We use Go BGP. Oh, uh, Go is good too. Go BGP is yeah. good as well. Actually, they're both yeah. really good. Yeah, so that's what is used under the hood by uh, by Cilium. Uh, but yeah, it's um, it's brilliant and uh, and again, kudos to the um, people of running the Container Lab project because it um, helps us run this type of labs. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, this is great. Man. Shout out. Yeah, and you know, to add on that real quick, like. You know, you always hear people say that protocols are protocols, right? Like if you understand the protocol, it's just implementation details. That's all that's different. So yep. if you know BGP, it's just a little bit different way of implementation, right? So yeah, yeah, it's not it's not that different. So awesome. Right. Uh yeah, this is great, man. This is really good stuff. Cool. I've been I've not been able to really look at you guys. It's quite hard because I've had my screen. <laughs> it's okay. You don't so, see our faces anyway. We all got face <laughs> face made for radio. <laughs> um, but no, man. Yeah, this awesome. has been great. I think it's been a great introduction to you know how to interact with the uh, the networking interface of Cilium and and things like that. So I think it'll be really useful. Yeah, awesome. um, yeah. Thank you very much, Nika, for coming on and showing us this. Um, how many how many labs do you guys have? Do you know oh, for networking at least? Um, yeah, so we have a uh, yeah in total thirty three. Probably have like ten, fifteen, fifteen that are like the networking people will will um will enjoy. Um, so yeah, we we even have something called a learning track for network engineers. So just give you a little kind of learning path to follow to uh, become more familiar with some of the networking features of Selim. Well, shit, I gotta get started then. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, he can see your names. You okay, better... I will. I will be looking out for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, S send me a nasty gram if I don't. If I don't do it. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, any anything you want to shout out before we wrap this up? Uh, I know you just wrote the book. You want to talk about that real quick before I we can. I can just. Uh, uh, can I just share my? We'll screen make again? sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll make sure we have yeah, the link ahead. as well yep. uh, to it. Awesome. Uh, let me do this quickly. Uh, 
right. I yeah, it's uh, something I've been meaning to do for a while is just to uh, write something up for uh, network engineers that have maybe found themselves intimidated by Kubernetes and by Kubernetes networking. I found myself a few years ago uh, reluctantly entering this. You know, Entering the space of Kubernetes, I, I just couldn't find any like uh, documentation or content that was kind of made for me. Um, so I thought, okay, now that this stuff makes more sense, I'm going to hopefully give back to the community. And it's only 56 pages. Um, you can read it in an hour or so and hopefully give you a good understanding of many of the concepts we talked about today um, around, yeah, Kubernetes, some of the Kubernetes networking model, etc. So, uh, yeah, we've had a phenomenal, <laughs> you know, downloads. I think it came out just five days ago. We've got over twelve hundred downloads already. So, uh, and the feedback has been has been pretty positive. So, any, um, yeah, um, I would love to hear more from people about uh, about it. And uh, yeah, I hope people uh, like it. I yeah. can I can say I downloaded it and I've already read it and I agree that it is great. So oh, okay, oh, it's a, awesome! It's a great it. primer. Um, yeah, it really kind of bridges the gap on uh, you know your traditional stuff and, and where you find it in Kubernetes and specifically with Cilium. So I think it was really great. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm I'm like halfway through and I agree it's been it's been great. I'm I'll I'll just finish it off real soon here, but it, it's good, man. It, it's hard to hit that. Uh, it's hard to hit that middle of the road and figure out how to bridge the gap between the two. So yeah, you definitely got right. nailed it. Awesome. So I'll, uh, I'll start working on volume two if uh, <laughs> you guys liked it. So Sounds like a plan. Awesome. Yeah. Well, and I think you, you said there wasn't a lot out there. I think you are probably the first one to start putting out a lot of material like this that is very much needed uh, as we're in the middle of this kind of paradigm shift towards all this new stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, there's so many people from Cisco, you know, they see, you know, they're, they're like, oh, who are these guys that are right. joining us? Uh, you know, we're, 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 you know, guys are cool kids, right? <laughs> they're all Kubernetes networking and stuff. And we're getting so many people from Cisco, all Cisco engineers that are, are, are curious. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that's, uh, it's a good primer for them. Yeah. I mean, I worked at Cisco awesome. too, and I know that you're going to be doing a lot of enablement. <laughs> so this will help you, this will help you get started. Yep. Yep. Yeah, no, it will, it will come. But yeah, All embracing right. it now. Well, awesome, Nico. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, you know, and for anybody listening that has made it this far, uh, thank you. Uh, please definitely share this episode around. It's been awesome talking to you on the the podcast episode as well as doing this demo. Uh, and I think, like I mentioned earlier, one day if we can get a, a part two to kind of dig a little deeper into some of the, the other use cases, I mean, 15 more labs, right? Like we haven't even <laughs> scratched the surface. So uh, it's been awesome talking to you. Thanks yeah, for tuning in. Was. And uh, yeah, and we'll talk to you guys next time. Bye. All right. Awesome. Hi, everyone. It's Alex. And this has been the Cables to Clouds podcast. Thanks for tuning in today. If you enjoyed our show, please subscribe to us in your favorite podcatcher, as well as subscribe and turn on notifications for our YouTube channel to be notified of all of our new episodes. Follow us on socials at Cables2Clouds. You can also visit our website for all of the show notes at CablesToClouds.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.